China. Let's start with China. All right, China. Um, China is in trouble. China is in trouble. The official GDP number came out for China. Now, let, just a little history here, recent history, very recent history. As, as, as recent as 2005, China was going at 11% a year. It actually grew faster in, uh, in 06. I think it went up to 14 point something. It was going double digit return, uh, rates, GDP growth. It had been growing double digit rates for the previous two decades. It was considered a economic miracle. Uh, it was considered the new model for the world, uh, interpreted as um, uh, you know what they called state capitalism, uh, state run, with some uh, status policies, with some free markets, and it was uh, yeah, it was truly uh, unbelievable. I think it was fourteen in in twenty two thousand seven. It was twelve and a half, or close to thirteen in two thousand six, and over eleven. In, in 2005, and it, it looked like this was going to go off forever, right? Forever. By 2019, by 2019, uh, that growth rate was cut in half. It was now uh, 6%. Um, and since then, the uh, growth rate has declined. Uh, and this year, Actually, it was below 6% in 2009. It was under 6%. And just recently, we heard that in the last quarter, um, the economy had slowed to just 0.4% growth. 0.4% growth. Um, this is post-COVID. This is post-2020. This is this year. Uh, the, the first quarter of this year. Now, given that these numbers are coming out of China and given that China has been known to smooth out its, its GDP numbers, um, it wouldn't surprise anybody, I don't think, that 0.4% uh, GDP growth in the first quarter of this year actually represents a, uh, a negative number. It wouldn't be surprised if China is probably in a recession um, and uh, seeing its economy shrink. I think this is probably for the first time. I don't know, it, 2020, it did better, significantly better than the West um, because, you know, it shut down early and then opened everything up, but it wasn't doing great. And uh, I think this is the first recession I can remember. And during the great financial crisis, China still grew at like 9% GDP growth a year. So uh, China is not doing well economically. It's doing quite badly. And, and there are many reasons for this. I mean, chief among them is central planning doesn't work. Statism with a little bit of capitalism, as the statism expands, doesn't work. Uh, ultimately, one or the other has to win. And in China, what's been winning has been um, has been statism. But um, uh, Noah Smith wrote an article uh, that I thought brought out three areas uh, that are the cause of this uh, decline in economic activity, particularly more recently over the last two, three years um, in China, particularly the decline under Xi. And uh, so, so we're going to talk about those, but we'll, we'll talk about more broadly about what's going on in China. China's economy. Uh, China's political leadership, China society is in trouble right now. Uh, Xi is is going up uh, for his uh, for the Communist Party big shindig that they do every five years. It'll be I think it's in November this year, and he he is going to be appointed basically premier for life. Uh, so this will break the kind of uh, term limits uh, that have been present in uh, in the Chinese leadership over, you know, since the death of Mao Zedong. He thought he would cruise into it. He thought this was going to be easy to become a dictator for life of China. He'll get it. There's no doubt about the fact that he'll get it. He, he, he is too much in control of that party, and he has basically uh, got rid of his opposition. 
but it's going to be a lot more difficult than he thinks. That is, there's going to be some murmurs, there's going to be some noise, there's going to be some challenges. The Chinese Communist Party does not like to fail. They do not like to, to have social unrest. They don't like to have problems out there in, in their world. And uh, it's happening. And uh, I don't, I think he's going to, I think it's not going to be easy for him, although he will get elected, I think. So elected, he will get chosen, whatever the hell that means. He will self-appoint himself uh, to the title of Premier for Life in, um, in November. But let's, let's review the three that uh, Noah uh, presents. Noah Smith has a substack that deals with economics. He's kind of a left of center type, but he often writes about China and Japan and other countries. Um, very insightful, uh, insightful economic analysis of them. Well, one, um, you know, one thing that's clearly happened is that China, um, in 2021, in early 2021, started cracking down on uh, its tech sector. Now, the tech sector until then, was for the most part uh, left alone. Uh, for, for 20 years or so, the tech sector had grown up organically within China. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there were state intervention, there were sub subsidies, there, were, there was stuff going on, but generally it was left free. M many, uh, many entrepreneurs became very, very wealthy, some became billionaires. Uh, there was a, a real entrepreneurial spirit, there was massive foreign investors, a lot of the, you know, the, the leading venture capitalist funds in the United States started investing in startups in China. There was the beginnings of real innovation, not just copying. Indeed, in, in some respects, uh, you know, China is more advanced than the United States and things like payment systems integrated into social media. Uh, they are far more advanced in the U.S., Online shopping, in many respects, is easier there than it is even here. Uh, so for a long time, Chinese growth and Chinese success was driven by the fact that this massive growth area, this massive area of foreign investment, was basically left alone. And we know what happens when you leave a market alone. You get an explosion in growth, entrepreneurship, and, and, and it can, you know, that's how you get 10, 14 percent. GDP growth, it's, it's because of the private sector and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial success. So that happened in China, and um, uh, the tech sector is a big driver of economic success in China over the last uh, 20 years, particularly over the last 10. Uh, for example, uh, China's been huge in games, in gaming, uh, maybe games that have not come to the West, but games in China. Um, what happened more recently is that China's decided that they want to more heavily regulate and manage the tech sector in a number of ways. One, they wanted to knock them down a few notches. They were getting a little arrogant. Some of the CEOs in the tech sector, some of the uh, big shots, um, were actually getting to the point where they were criticizing the Communist Chinese Party or particular policies. That's not acceptable. You can't do that. So they were chopped down a few notches, uh, brought down a few notches. Um, uh, these billionaires were gaining too much power, too much popularity, too much just hype in, in the Chinese public. Uh, so as a consequence, again, Jack Ma was a good example. They wanted to take them down a few notches. And one way to take them down a few notches is maybe to put somebody like Jack Ma under house arrest or, or just to do things that would lower the market value of these fir firms, which would lower the wealth of the founders and the CEOs. Um, they also wanted to regulate uh, a variety of, uh, in the name of safety and consumer and all kinds of that protection, uh, just get more control over the sector, just have more say. And one of the big pushes was, you know, the tech sector is evolving organically which means that uh, people are investing in companies and companies are employing people and products are produced based on, uh, based on supply and demand, uh, you, you know, based on market parameters. And as a consequence of this, for example, um, you know, there were, four, uh, you know, just uh, there were tens of thousands of gaming companies. 
and, 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 and hundreds of thousands of employees uh, working for gaming companies. And China thought that that talent was misplaced, that talent was um, underutilized, and uh, they uh, preferred that that talent go into places like semiconductors, electric vehicles, air, aircraft manufacturing, maybe uh, cybersecurity, things like that. Things where, you know, the state has an interest that those be the sectors that are emphasized. So as a consequence, they work to shut down about 14,000 video game companies um, and to try to drive talent out of a lot of the tech companies that had grown up organically within China and that had been uh, successful uh, in an attempt, again, to highlight the, the, where the state wanted funds, resources, and talent to go into. This didn't go well. Chinese stock market collapsed. People lost gazillions of dollars. Chinese consumers were hurt. Chinese, uh, many people lost their jobs. But more importantly, even the Chinese leadership got a sense that the entrepreneurial, uh, the entrepreneurial mindset that the Chinese had benefited from, the, the, the entrepreneurial ambition that was there was, was slowly seeping out. People were unmotivated. Uh, you know, in, in the past in China, people actually returned from the U.S. to China because they felt like they could go into a field, they could build something, they could benefit the results. Yeah, there was an autocratic regime, an authoritarian regime at the top, but uh, that regime didn't really care about them, left them alone to do their thing. And so people were enthused about entrepreneurship in China. And that was going away. People were not afraid. They'd be successful at business. The business would grow and the business would thrive. And then the Chinese government would step in and uh, start regulating, start controlling it, start limiting it, or destroy it because some bureaucrat didn't like it. Again, we're talking about authoritarianism. So uh, those people withdrew, capital withdrew, foreign capital withdrew, again, for the same reason. If we can't trust that these companies can go public, we can make a lot of money, we're not going to invest here. Now, this has all had a profound impact on the stock market and tech entrepreneurship and tech development to such an extent that in the last few months, the Chinese government has signaled that it is backtracking, which it almost never does, that it is backtracking, that maybe destroying one sector of the economy is not a great way to get support for another sector. So they started saying things like, um, you know, that, they, that they're going to reduce the regulations on IT on the tech sector, uh, that they're actually going to uh, allow or, or support the tech sector's efforts to uh, go public overseas and to lift overseas, and, and generally send as many messages as they could through a variety of different channels that, hey, the crackdown's over, we got what we wanted, we're leaving you alone, go back to the way it was, we'll facilitate it going back to the way it was. Uh, uh, it, last year, one of the things they also did was um, discouraged Chinese companies from listing in Western exchanges. So that backtracking for that. It's not working, so far at least. There's ongoing paranoia and paralysis um, and uh, executives, there's lack of investment, there's lack of that entrepreneurial excitement and, uh, and vigor that, um, uh, that existed before. So it's, it's not easy. This is why I think you're seeing Chinese, um, Chinese economic growth 
stumble as bad as it has. So that's one reason. Crack down on tech, attempt to backtrack from that, which has been unsuccessful. Second thing um, uh, that they did over the last couple of years, real estate. Now, for many, many, many years, really decades, uh, China has been heavily subsidizing uh, real estate uh, growth, the building of buildings. It's allowed uh, and facilitated uh, the ability of real estate developers to uh, get cheap loans and to super leverage themselves and to build, 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 even in places where there was no demand, uh, to create these ghost cities that ultimately are filled, but not in an economic kind of justifiable way. Uh, by some estimates, 30% of the entire Chinese economy was basically real estate development. Well, this was not sustainable. And uh, the Chinese government started to clamp down. Remember, Chinese banks are basically run by the government. They are government banks. So, uh, you know, the loans that are given to real estate developers by banks are not private loans. The loans that are, in a sense, subsidized by the government, well, they start cutting back on that. Um, and uh, started cutting back on the building of, uh, uh, on buildings to the extent that a lot of building projects just stopped. Uh, you know, uh, some skyscrapers three quarters in have not been completed. A lot of residential buildings where people had supposedly bought apartments and now not being built. So we've got abandoned construction projects all over China. So, and you've got these developers going bankrupt, you've got these developers defaulting on debt, uh, you've got developers begging for new lending and no new lending is coming. So you've got a real contraction on something that might be 30% of the Chinese economy. Again, they're trying to back paddle because the economy's not doing well. So they're trying to get the local governments to invest in real estate and to promote more real estate construction. They've slashed mortgage rates so that people can afford homes. Central bank is pushing banks now, a reversal from last year, to increase real estate lending, in, at least in big cities. But again, it's not particularly helping. Indeed, I don't know if you've been hearing this on the news, but uh, a couple of things about this in the news recently, just in the last few days. Uh, it turns out that a lot of Chinese people have stopped paying their mortgage. Uh, so what they did was they would take out a mortgage before the condo, before the apartment was completed. And they would use the mortgage to buy a, a, an apartment on spec. And now the construction has stopped. They're stopping to pay the mortgages. So uh, millions of Chinese are basically not paying into the system, not paying the mortgage, which banks have expected, which developers have expected, which is only going to work cause the real estate market to collapse even further. But the trust that Chinese citizens had in this whole system, where they, in a sense, will provide financing in advance before the building was built, that trust is collapsing. And therefore, don't expect the Chinese to be funding, Chinese citizens, again, individuals, to be funding these projects uh, in the near future. Uh, real estate defaults have gone up significantly. Right? The other thing that's been happening, and this relates in an indirect way, but in a couple of provinces in China, there have been some banks that have frozen the deposits of their customers. So you can't get your money out of the bank. And there have been significantly, significant and large demonstrations in dozens of cities around China of bank customers demanding to get their money back. And again, this, the Chinese don't like demonstrations. They don't like unrest. The Chinese Communist Party, the whole motto is stability. Stability, peace above all things. 
They do not want people upset. And here they are again. Um, here we are again seeing that trust in the banking system, their trust in the real estate, um, collapsing common people in, common people in China, um, basically losing trust in the regime. And that is scary for the communist regime. Finally, uh, so real estate we know is collapsing. We've got, uh, we've got real estate, in, in, which is causing real problems with banks. We've got technology, uh, the problems in technology. Finally, we've got the zero COVID policy in China. China has this crazy policy where they don't want COVID, zero. Like the rest of the world is pretty much figured out, it seems, we'll see, that we're just going to have to live with COVID. And we're all going to get COVID. And it's, it's, it's at this point, um, in its uh, degree of deadliness, particularly given uh, vaccines, COVID is just another flu. It's just another, it's just another seasonal virus. And we're just going to have to live with it. And that's basically what the West has recognized. So people have gone back to work. Uh, people are doing events. People are doing indoor dining. People are not wearing masks. Uh, world has gone back to basically normal, but not in China. In China, every time there's a sign of COVID, they shut a city down. They do these massive lockdowns, sometimes for weeks on weeks, which shuts down production, shuts down demand. And again, makes it very, very difficult to have economic growth. We have vaccines that work. The Chinese do not have vaccines that work. Indeed, the Chinese are trying to develop an mRNA vaccine to try to get them out of zero COVID. They don't want to import it from the West because that, then I'll acknowledge they failed to develop a, a good vaccine. So they are trying to develop their own mRNA vaccine. But it's a, you know, it's a complete and utter disaster. I mean, as, as, um, you know, it looks like there are six cities right now, at least about a week ago, six cities and counties with widespread lockdowns, 30 million people under COVID curbs. I mean, you can't run an economy that way. We discovered that in America. We discovered that in the West. And China's, but China's going on and on and on and on. And while many people within China think that this is a stupid strategy and that we need to move away from it. Every time somebody comes out of the woodwork saying, uh, in the regime saying, well, we need to move away from this, Xi doubles down on zero COVID. So Xi has basically made it his mission to, to have a world of, have a China of zero COVID. What you're seeing here, I think, is just the beginning. I don't think China uh, as an economy is over. I don't think it's finished. I think there's still a lot of dynamism there, and there's still uh, uh, an element of, of freedom and certainly in certain sectors within the Chinese economy. But what we're seeing is, you know, a, 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 um, an adjustment to reality. That is, central planning doesn't work. Maybe it can have some positive results in the very short run, but it doesn't work. Maybe it can artificially project a higher GDP or higher economic growth, but long term, it doesn't work. And what happens to authoritarians is not that they, over time, become less and less authoritarian, but it's much more likely, much more likely, to be Sorry, it's much more likely that authoritarians will increase over time, that controls will increase over time, regulations will increase over time. And the fact is, the fact is, globally, it doesn't matter what country you're in, controls, regulations, central planning, manipulating the economy always backfires. It is not pro-growth. So China is in trouble in the short run. 
and China's in trouble in the long run. It might get better, and then it'll get worse. But the whole attempt to combine some elements of freedom with authoritarian rule doesn't work. Doesn't work. Let's see. If you look at, if you even look at, uh, you know, Beijing, Shanghai, now that they've opened up after the lockdowns, uh, you know, consumption is down significantly in both places. Um, people have not returned yet to normal. If you look at every single parameter from an economic perspective, China is struggling right now. Now, granted, so is the West, so is the United States, and we haven't seen the worst of it. Uh, you know, the whole world is in for quite a shock in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, e the economy. And, um, but China's not going to be immune for that. China's probably going to be uh, worse, if not as bad, if not worse, than the rest of the world in terms of its economic prospects. Um, China could be the most dynamic, exciting, largest economy in the world by far. But to actually do that, they would actually have to adopt freedom as a principle, or at least be as free as the West is. If China was as free as the West is, um, yeah, there's no, there's no, I mean, they're incredibly hardworking, incredibly ambitious, um, incredibly devoted to self-improvement. Uh, the Chinese could be unbelievably wealthy. What's holding them back is what holds us back. It's the central planning, it's the controls, it's the regulations, it's all of that. All right, I mean, the Chinese, wherever you go in the world, have always done well economically. I mean, look at Singapore. Uh, when they're allowed to be free, look at Hong Kong, look at Thai, uh, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia, where uh, a significant amount of the wealth belongs to the Chinese minorities. Um, they, are, they have a, an incredible work ethic. They're very entrepreneurial, um, and they, they make money. They make money. We'll see what happens in China, but I am, uh, I am suspicious. Of their, I'm, I'm uh, uh, skeptical of their ability to continue to grow significantly and to be a threat, as everybody imagines, a threat to the United States and other places. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to yourownbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one of those uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and of course subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.